One month before the release of The Devil and Me, I made a video talking about three things I want to see and that I don't want to see. Now it's been one month since the release of the game, so I think it's now finally time to make a video similar to the one we did before, this time talking about things I enjoyed and did not. Just at this time it will be six things I enjoyed and four things I did not. So a lot of things I really really enjoyed and some I didn't. I guess this also works as some sort of review for the game, so lean back as I share my thoughts on the devil in me. Charlie Lonnie, that's my guy right there. Charlie Lonnie. First of all, I don't dislike Jamie, Kate, or Mark. I think the entire cast might be the strongest in the Dark Bridges anthology alongside House of Ashes. It's just that Charlie and Aaron are easily some of my favorite characters throughout the entire franchise. Charlie, on the one hand, is an entertainment machine. So many enjoyable and memorable moments, from his antics to his humor or the generally brilliant line delivery by amazing voice actor Paul K. Additionally, his character is also just so intriguing to follow along. You can shape him to be the fully arrogant and aggressive dick of a boss that infuriates everybody or becomes the man that sees his mistakes and turns things around for the better not just to escape the killer but also to improve his relationship with his workers. Additionally, the entire complicit angle might be the one that intrigued me the most to see unfold and it was quite unfortunate it had to end by, you know what. On the other end, we have Eren and trust me, it still hurts that a character. Not as much as one month ago, but it still stinks to have lost her midway through the game. But even then, the moments I had with her and everything else I saw after the playthrough, Eren might be one of the most likable characters in the entire franchise. Cute, innocent, and just a sweetheart all the way through that immediately activated my must protect instincts, which is why I chose to kill her. <laughs> Yeah, the characters were all enjoyable, but Charlie and Aaron the most to me. Hey, you got a ghoul accent. Mentioning killing Aaron, I still think that the suffocation chamber is the biggest flaw of the game. A choice that tells me to kill one of two characters that only one can truly die, while the other will survive no matter what, is just bad writing, no discussion allowed. There should have been a way to make it possible that not only both characters can die, yet also that both are saveable. Have it be that Kate, who can fully miss picking up um, her spiritual crystal beforehand, then loses the spiritual crystal while running away, and Jamie or Mark can manage to grab it off the ground with a quick time event, and only with that rock, yes Georgina, I called it a rock, they can break her window. For Aaron, a similar case, have her drop her mic holder with the sharp end while on the run, and then Mark or Jamie can catch it while running away, and then use it to break open her window, or as you may realize by now, either two would be able to break either person's window here, so if two is too many, only if it work with Aaron's mic thingy, I guess a sharp end seems more realistic to break a window with than some small, useless rock. But you get what I'm trying to say, it would be possible for Kate and Eren to lose out on these tools before reaching the strap depending on your choices, even before Mark or Jamie could catch it on your way. It would depend on your choices beforehand if both can survive the strap. If you fail to keep either of those two items, or as mentioned just Eric's mic knife, then one will die and you basically decide. This was one of my thoughts to fix the trap, because the way it is right now it just feels very cheap and lame that Kate will always survive even if it literally says kill Kate. It's both lazy writing and bad form of plot armor. Back in the pre The Devil in Me release video, I talked about less focus on romances. Yet, now that the game is here, they are probably one of the strongest writing aspects of the game. We did get the LGBTQ relationship with Eren and Jamie that even got its own bearing, hell yeah. The killer tried to get Eren to not trust Jamie, but your choices can lead to a happy end after all. While on the other hand, we have Kate and Mark, a couple that once was, mutually broke up, but can't find by... Can't but... Uh but can find back together, no toxicity between the two, and depending on your choices, they as well can find back together with a bright future ahead of themselves, given their circumstances. Both relationships work very well in the setting of the game, don't feel forced nor annoying, and only value the story and the game. Keep that up for future titles. As we already mentioned during the suffocation chamber debate, there was it again a clear case of plot armor that I did enjoy and it actually goes beyond that of the trap. Because if Kate does manage to survive the glass trap later on, she literally can die until one of the two endings. Going through all the things 
where Eren and Jamie are able to die in. Now, apparently it's done that way because the killer actually wants Kate to walk into his fire trap to keep the circle alive, which is the same case for why he doesn't kill Mark beforehand, which I guess works as a writing reason that is actually fueled by the killer's motive, but man, I don't know, I just can't bring myself to like it. Charlie, Eren and Jamie can die from so many things, it just feels infuriating and frustrating looking at how protected Kate and Mark are by the plot that sees them being targeted for that ultimatum. Again, I gotta give them credit for making the plot armor at least logical in some aspect of the story, definitely more logical than the plot armor in previous entries, but just because the plot armor is logical doesn't necessarily make it enjoyable. It does add a layer to the killer, as some even say he purposely made the window easily breakable in the chamber to keep Kate alive at all costs without losing out on breaking her beforehand, but he then somewhat makes it possible that she does can die in a glass wall trap? You see what I'm going for. Plot armor that is mostly story logical, but still a way of writing that I'm not a fan of. In my humble opinion, I would consider Grand Femme du Mat the best antagonist of the franchise since the Winnie or in this case, the best antagonist of the Dark Pictures anthology. At one point I was even actually debating if it's on the same level, but the Winnie remains untouchable. However, The Killer and the Devil Me was one of the game highlights without a single doubt. Basically every scene including him is one of the game's best. The build up towards the first reveal, his design, his behavior, his motive, the lack of talking, his love for stalking, his presence, his music choices, I could go on and on. Everything about the man was memorable and made the entire playthrough experience a special one. Midway through, you started to wonder, is he even a human, or more than one? And at the end, you wonder, is he immortal? The mystery about his identity fueled by the presence of him and so much more. Additionally, Grand Fondurant is the most evil in the franchise to date. He doesn't want to kill quick, he wants to torture his victims mentally and physically in several ways. And on top of that, if the traps don't do the trick, the way he kills our characters is brutal. Grandfather Matt, truly the best villain of the franchise since Until Dawn. And as we already mentioned, alongside the traps, the kills that Dumet executes are some of the most gory, memorable and best in all of the games. Entirely crushed by a grinder, a needle through the eye, head split open by an axe, decapitation, a gas canister to stomach, injected with hydrochloride acid and even the sniper call at the end is horrifying knowing what led up to it. Once again, in this category, it might very likely be the best amount of kills since Until Dawn and I can't wait to rank them very soon. Bravo. Now beforehand, we already knew that the game would be longer in length than the previous three entries, yet not as long as Until Dawn or The Quarry, and the question was, will this additional time be used well in a way where it feels warranted, or not? And for the most part I'd say yes, but a few sections kind of bored me. This happened mostly in the early game, and while I thought that the entire opening all with Charlie and Mark plus Jimmy and Kate worked well, the first section there was kind of whatever was Kate and Mark in that library. There wasn't lots of character work and the entire maze thing with Mark just dragged on for no reason. The next section this was with Jamie, after everyone got abducted, where you had to find this stupid fucking code. Maybe I'm just stupid, but that section also dragged on for a while because I just couldn't find it. Felt like a very annoying filler in between the sections with Aaron and the killer. And last but not least, the other section that really bored me was the spa with Jamie, Kate and Mark. That one jump scare was fun, yes, but it also felt like a very dragging filler before the suffocation chamber. Outside of that, I think each of other individual sections had enough to make them enjoyable from the killer involved to the general setting, but these three are probably the sections I would have done differently and enjoyed the least. It's not a huge critic point, but it would definitely the sanctions I would have changed. One of the things that I really wanted to see in this game was a better horror balance than previous games. House of Ashes was very action heavy with little to no truly scary sections, while the quarry felt even less terrifying in any aspect, which didn't make the games necessarily bad, but no previous game was able to reach Unto Dawn's level of horror, as Men of Medan and Little Hope were relying too much on jump scares. The Devil and Me found an amazing balance, with many factors playing into making it work, where we talked about how the kill himself was incredible, feeling both threatening and intriguing, making sections like the one with Aaron in the blackout room, Mark in the workshop, or the chase with Jamie, true highlights of the game for me. But even without the killer's direct involvement, there were many terrifying sequences, especially the one with Aaron in noises or Charlie Mark in the corpse house. The jump scares were well placed, the killer was used perfectly, yet the game didn't get too overwhelming, and there was enough entertainment, storytelling, and funny moments in between to make the game truly enjoyable. I played through the game in two sessions, and beside the already mentioned slower sections, it was a blast to play with a much better horror balance the previous titles, and once again, probably the best since Until Dawn. 
My final critique point is a bit more of a specific one that needs some explaining. One of the most satisfying aspects of all the games are how your choices influence the events of the story and how the outcome will look like. A choice from the first few minutes could have huge impact on something hours later. Boom. Butterfly effect. And honestly, I felt like this was kind of missing this time around, or at least not as prominent as in previous titles. Obviously, your choices still mattered and shaped the outcome of your story, but much more immediately. Basically, all choices and their impact happen instantly, like right after or just a few moments later. In Unto Dawn, shooting a crow or not within the first few minutes had an effect on you hours later during a chase sequence that kinda didn't happen this time. What I'm trying to say is, each supermassive title has had several branch choices that will impact your playthrough much, much later. The only thing I can think of this time around is Eren's entire and Halo situation and Mark making his camera stick to a weapon. Even Eren accusing Charlie if it's like a choice that gets resolved basically instantly. Your choices still decide everything, yet basically basically in the moment rather than unknowingly hours beforehand. Especially with the increased game length, I would have enjoyed more focus on choices like this, but it's definitely not the worst part of the game. And last but not least, this game has absolutely incredible endings, maybe even the best in the entire series. Both the boat sequence and the ultimatum ending are simply amazing, with the latter having a great shot at not only being in the top 3 of best endings across all supermassive games, but maybe even the top 1 spot. That's something for your future ranking video to decide. And even after either of the two endings, we get the reveal that the bat is still alive and that his next victims are already on the way. A brilliant finish to a brilliant game. This is it with today's video. Did you enjoy it? What are your thoughts? Do you agree with mine? What do you have to think and to say about The Devil Me and its many, many things? Tell me all about it down below in the comments. As always, we have so much stuff to look forward to. So many more videos I want to do. I already made a post once talking about minimum 10 videos I want to do about The Devil Me and other super massive games. So look forward to it. And a lot of new playful projects coming up in the upcoming time as well. So for whatever content you may be interested in, for whatever content you may be interested in for, I'll see you again soon on this channel. Stay safe, have been happy, have happy holidays, and see you again soon with more super massive games and other videos on this channel. Thank you for watching. Bye.